<laughs> What's going on? It's Monday night, man. Y'all know what time it is. It's Cardell Sims here, and I'm back with another episode of the reentry journey. Tonight, man, I got a guest who has an amazing story, who got amazing knowledge, keys, and will show you that no matter what we've been through as far as incarceration, that you can always bounce back and, and raise yourself to another level 10 times. My guest tonight is Dr. Craig Wally. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you came on. I, I seen your story. I had to reach out. I reached out about a month ago and I and I had a double back because I'm like, I'm missing something. And I said, oh, yeah, I got to get back with you. Man. I, need, I need you on the podcast. And I've been checking out some things about you, man. And your transition and your and I'm just I was at all just this reading the story and then not just understanding where you're coming from and what you've been through as far as prison and, and in an environment that you was raised in, but how you got out of prison and just elevated. I'm talking about the things I was reading, man. I was like, oh man. So go ahead and uh introduce yourself to the, the people that's tuned in and, and let them know about your story. Yeah, man. Well, thanks, Cardell, for having me. And I definitely appreciate you reaching out to me, um, connecting with me again. Um, as you said, my name is Craig Waleed. I just like to go by Craig. I tell people my name is Craig and I just happen to have a doctorate degree. So, you know, in certain situations, you can call me doctor, but in most cases, just call me Craig. Um, I'm from Rochester, New York, which is in western New York, up by Buffalo, between Buffalo and Syracuse, up in the snow country. Um, I lived there for most of my life. I'm 50 years old, um, I, but I just moved from there to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. I've been in Raleigh, North Carolina since um, July of 2020. So that this is where I'm at. But um, prior to that, I um, grew up in Rochester, came from a single parent home, um, working class home, but again, single parent home. So, you know, because of that, I think I... I I didn't have the guidance that I needed because my mother was constantly working, trying to make sure we got a house and food and clothes and all of that. And so early in my life, I suffered a variety of abuses, sexual abuse, uh, physical abuse, verbal abuse. And um, as I got older, I remember maybe around age of 10 or 11, I remember telling myself, nobody going to ever hurt me again. You know, if anybody try to hurt me, I'm going to get them back. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get them before they get me. And so... From that point, that seed was planted that, you know, I'm going to be a predator, you know. And so I began preying on other people, you know. I was always on the low, real cool. But if I felt like some, I was at um, under a threat, I struck first. I struck hard and I struck one, two, three, four times if I needed to, you know. But that's how that, that mentality built. You know, I was a, afraid of becoming a victim. And so most of my life, I grew up afraid and um, um, ashamed of what I had gone through because I didn't realize, you know, I was a child and um, nobody should have to go through this and that I was powerless. But I grew up with this misunderstanding that, you know, men, boys, black boys in particular, black men, that we don't become victims. And, you know, if we are victims, then we got to strike out and show people that this is not what's going to happen to me again. I'm not going to let you do this to me. And so, you know. I think from the time I was like maybe 12 or 13, I started experimenting with drugs, um, experimenting with sex, experimenting with alcohol, um, stealing. Um, as I got older, I started burglaring, um, assaulting people, um, mugging people, doing all kinds of stuff, breaking and entering. You know, and um, long story short, uh, around the time I think I was going on 19, I got into a very vicious fight. I ended up stabbing someone pretty bad, ended up getting arrested and going to prison on a 4 to 12 for assault and attempt murder in the first degree. So, oh. yeah. So, okay. yeah. So, so you, um, you find yourself sitting inside a prison cell, you know, and you was going through, uh -oh, hold on. Mm -hmm. Hold on for a second. I got to fix some things. All right. How to do this. So yeah, I'm gonna ask a question. I'm 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 be able to come back in. So okay. you, you you found yourself going through the prison sentence, right? Yeah. And you're sitting in prison. What was your thoughts when you entered the prison? That once you when you walked inside of a prison, what 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 was your thoughts? Like what was what was on your mind? What was you really thinking? Like 
your first time being in prison? You know, that's a great question, man. Um, I'll tell you, there was quite a few things that went through my mind, but prior to going to prison, you know, I had been arrested a couple of times and had done some county time, but not a whole lot of time. Um, so I was I was a bit used to the bars already or kind of knew what to expect because some of the old timers in prison or in jail was telling me what to expect in prison. But it was nothing like once I really got behind those bars, you know, when those gates clanged, when I saw that big that big old steel um, concrete wall and, you know, all that steel and whatnot. Um, I think the first thing that came to my mind, really, man, if I could be frank, was, man, I done fucked up. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm in deep shit. You know, right. To be honest, I was afraid. I was even more afraid than I thought I was as a young child, you know, because I'm thinking, okay, all the myths that I heard about prison, all the things I seen on TV, all of that started to play out in my mind. So I'm thinking I'm gonna have to fight, I'm gonna have to stab, I'm gonna have to kill, you know, in order to make it in this place. And so right. that's all I was looking out for, you know, the extortion guy, the booty bandit, you know, all those things. And I'm like, I, I don't know how I'm going to live here. But at the same time, I realized that I can't just fight and cut and stab and, and be felonious because if I keep doing that, I'll never get out of this place. Exactly. And I'll be dying in this place, you know, and I had a four to 12 to do. So I knew I had to do at least four years before I was considered to be released. But I ended up doing eight years because of the severity of my crime and they conditional release me after eight years, you know? But right. almost immediately, man, um, again, I realized I'm not that, I'm not that thug that I thought I was. I'm not that tough guy. I'm not that predator that I thought I was because I started really getting a close up of some real predators, some real thugs, some real tough guys dudes that didn't have nothing to lose, you know? I had something to lose because, you know, I didn't share this in my intro, but, you know, growing up, though I had a single parent home, we always lived in a house. We always had a car. We always had clothes, you know? We always had food, you know? My mother used to send me to private schools, yo, you know? Then she sent me to public schools. Then she bought a new house. I mean, a brand new house, bro. And we lived in the suburbs, just me and her. You know, so I went to urban suburban schools. I finished high school. You know, most of my people were working class people. They worked, they went to church. You know, they were good people. I was the first person to ever go to prison or jail for the most part in my family. So I knew what it was like to have a decent life, you know, and in reality, I wasn't a killer. I wasn't a thug. I was just an afraid child. So being in prison, I realized, look, I got something to go back to. You know, I know a little something different than what brought me here. So let me lean on that, because if not, I'll never get a chance to go back to maybe trying to live this life the right way. And so for my first couple of, couple years, of years, I spent a lot of time reading, um, writing, um, meditating. And um, I think that put me on the track. And so really for my entire eight year sentence, I spent most of my time reading, writing, meditating. Um, helping other people um, read their letters, um, interpret their, their legal work, um, go through books that their family sent them. And then, you know, in any prison or almost in any environment, you know, I guess to, to, to use the old phrase, you know, uh, birds of a feather flock together, you know, in prison, you know, you got dudes that's really trying to gain knowledge of self. You got dudes that's really trying to elevate their minds. And then you have more people who are really still stuck into the shit that brought them to prison. And so I wanted to be around those guys who were really trying to elevate their minds. And so I spent most of my time with them, you know, exchanging books, exchanging narratives, exchanging dialogue and creating visions for myself once I got out, you know? So yeah, cause I, I, I when I was reading up on you, I seen when you was talking about how you had to make your incarceration a place of education for you. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I think that's I think that's I think that's really important for people to understand. Those of you that's tuning in, like when you if you got family members that's, that's incarcerated, it's it's a must that they educate. It has to become a place of uh, education for them. Because like with me, when I was out, that's all I did was just educate myself. You know, yeah. uh, 
learning things that, you know, I thought I would never be able to learn. And mm -hmm. not only just learn it, comprehend it at the same time, instead of just reading hood novels, I just started studying knowledge itself, getting right. to understanding me, mm -hmm. uh, business laws, and yeah. everything else due to that nature. So yeah. I, I kind of like how you said that you had to make the place of acculturation a place of education for you. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I sometimes I tell people while I was in those prison cells and in those cubicles and behind the walls, I literally traveled the world through the pages of books. And it was through those travels that I became, uh, became much more educated, much more knowledgeable than I had ever been because the schools didn't prepare me uh, correctly. You know, my parent and, and, you know, the people who were responsible for raising me, they only knew but so much. But once I start digging into those books, in a sense, they started causing me to go back into myself and bring out those qualities that were within myself, you know. And I think the more I knew about myself, the greater educated I was. Whereas, you know, the reading helped, um, in a sense, educate me, but more so train me or just give me knowledge. And, and what I mean is, like, if we go into, like, the etymology of the word educate, it comes from this Latin word um, educo or educere which means to bring out that which is already within. So mm -hmm. learning knowledge of self, understanding what my, my qualities were, what my interests were, what my proclivities were, um, that's when I really became um, educated. Sort of like what the ancient Egyptians uh, taught the, uh, uh, the initiates of their, their um, mystery temples. Above the door of the mystery temples was the inscription, man, know thyself. Exactly. Know thyself is the first tenet of all knowledge. And so I had to learn myself. And to be honest, I still don't know myself. I'm still learning myself, you know. So it's an ongoing, lifelong process. But I think that getting on that road is what helped lead me out of prison. So really, while I was incarcerated, I began to find freedom. But also I started... Uh, engaging in academic um, um, processes. You know, I, I got hold of an academic program. They were um, promoting or they were bringing in college credit courses. And so I became a student in the college program in, in prison. And I think the reading and, and, and the academic studies, um, in a way, they acted like what a, a farmer's um, 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 plow does to, to fallow ground. You know, when the farmer takes the plow through, it breaks up the fallow ground, making it easier to plant seeds. And so in a sense, you know, the studies that I did, the academics, the, the self-knowledge, the self-studies, in a sense, it kind of turned over the soil of my cognitive space, making me more receptible or more receptive to different ideals, different imageries, different possibilities for myself that I had never, ever considered. You know what I'm saying? And so once I began to see other black people or just other oppressed people and read about them and learn about them, um, I began to see myself in their place. And I started to envision a better life for myself. I knew that I was coming out of prison and I knew that I did, I did not want to come back. Right. And I, and I, I remember you saying that, um, not now, but I was listening to an interview of yours. You were talking about how you was had to destroy the myths that you once believed that what a black man should be. What were some of them myths that you had to destroy? Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, and I think, you know, many of those myths um, still persist today, you know, and some of them are, you know, black men are not intellectual. You know, we don't do well in school. You know, we reject school. Um, we're more physical. Um, beings. Um, black men are not um, honest. Black men are not trustworthy. Um, black men are slick, you know. Um, and then from my own life's experience also, you know, black men don't stick around for their children, you know. And I didn't share this, but, you know, prior to going to prison, I became a father. I was a father at 18 years of age, you know. And so in many regards, you know, my father wasn't there and then I turned around and I left my daughter. You know, my daughter was born just before I went to prison. She was like eight and a half years old when I got out. You know, she's 32 years old now and I don't know her. And it's all because I went to prison. You know, so that thing was messed up. 
Yeah. Um, you know, uh, when I would like, I had my, I had children. I had three children, and then I had before I went to prison. But I had one on the way while I was in prison, so I had four, and I was in prison. Mm-hmm. Then when I got out, I got out, made another one, but I went back. So my whole, all my children's whole life, except for the last three years since I've been home, that's what it's been with them. I've been in, in and out of prison, like you said. Like I really don't know them because I, I, I ain't never been there. I right. Yeah, except for these last three years, and then on top of that, I, I I'm just now building trust. Uh, you know, what I'm saying in them or from them because I used to say I ain't gonna get locked up. I, I'm gonna be here, and then I turn around and get locked up. Mm-hmm. So now I can't come out and say that because they, you know. And then I had to reintegrate into their lives mm-hmm. because when I was in prison. They was the kids when I came out. You talking about some of them graduated mm-hmm. and they're teenage years they had their own life so i had to i couldn't just come out and say you know i'm, I'm home and it's, it's all you know we're gonna you know i had to find a way to foot it in just like you said like in a sense i done missed out who they really are so i don't really know them because i mm-hmm. never had that time to really get to understand them to know what they're going through and even now it's kind of mm-hmm. kind of weird so because on the fact that they they they've been doing this, you know, saying with their mothers and with them, you know, saying, but they've been doing it without me, really, you know. Yeah, it's like, who's this dude? Yeah, that's, that, that's what it is. Like, who's you yeah. know this, you know? And then I got a, uh, one of my oldest son, you know, he followed in my footsteps. So then he found himself in prison, and he found himself, you know, saying fighting cases and things like that. And so it, it, it's kind of hard to, you know, it's like you said about that myth. You know, my father wasn't there and he was caught up in the streets. And I always tell people, you can't be a full time person in the street and a full time parent. It, that, that don't, that's never going to that's, ne- that's never going to happen. No, you sir. Know? You, you got to you got to commit to one master or the other, you know, yeah. one Lord or the other. You got to either be in the streets or you got to be, you know, in the community at home trying to do the right things. Exactly. And I know, think, go ahead. I was just going to say, and, and I think that that's what really settled for me, realizing that I had lost connection with my daughter. I wasn't going to get her back. But one of the things that I, I also thought about, and you said it, you know, I can't say I'm not going to go back to jail. I'm not going to go back to prison. But so many people have done that and they go right back. You know, I went back on a violation. I was being irresponsible. Um, luckily, I didn't get a new charge, but I was out for three years. I had four years on paper and I went back, went back for six months. But once I got back out, I got right back on my grizzle and I started doing the right things that I knew I was supposed to be doing. I had gotten loose. But what I know and understand about this life is it's not so much about what we say, but it's about what we do, you know. And so I figured my life is going to be about showing and proving, showing and proving. And one of the things that really made me feel alive was being involved in that in that um, college program when I was in prison. You know, I saw like the, the professors who were coming in. I started looking at them as like role models. Um, and then after that, I started thinking about the, the the time that I spent in the school building on the college, I mean, in the prison um, campus. That school building during that time that I was taking college courses became to me like a holy place. And wow. those professors and those professors became like the clergy to me, the high priest, you know, and I wanted to be like them. Because, you know, I found my time, myself many a time engaging in, in, in very strong um, back and forth debates with the professors. And that let me know, man, I'm I'm just as bright as these cats, if not brighter, you know, not to toot my own horn, you know. But I was like, this is what I need to do, you know. And I just felt alive going to school. And so I remember telling some cats when I was locked up, man, when I get out, I'm going to college. And it was like, man, you crazy. You're going to be right back here with the rest of us, you know, and that almost came true. But I got out and I enrolled in college, man, like two years after I got out and I started taking courses. But then I caught this violation. But after the violation, I got out and I went right back to school. And so in 2000, I got out in 1997. Um, by 1999, I had did, done the violation. Um, I came out in 2000 or maybe it was 2000. I did the violation and came out in 01. Yeah, that's what it was. But anyway. When I got out, I went back to school, um, ended up graduating with an undergraduate 
in um, substance abuse counseling in 2005. It was actually in health science with a concentration in substance abuse counseling. And that was in 05. And so I started working. You know, I said, okay, this is starting to separate me from most cats who go to go to prison. Because most cats who go to prison, they don't come out and get certified or degreed or anything. You know, they continue to struggle for most of their lives, you know. So I wanted to separate myself and show uh, my family, show people that I didn't know, people that were watching me from afar, that I'm not this horrible guy who committed this horrible act, though I did it and I take full responsibility for it, but there's more to me than that. And so that's one part of why I went to school, but I also started going to school because while I was in prison, I spent a lot of time talking to cats who kept going home and coming back, going home and coming back. And I'm like, well, damn, when am I gonna get to go home? So I would spend time talking with these guys about what brought you back to prison, man? You got out. Why don't you stay out? I just didn't understand it. And so talking to them, I started getting an understanding of what brought them back to prison. So even while I was inside, I started developing this plan to stay out of prison. And part of that plan was going to school. But I figured, you know, living in prison, I was I was already in institutionalized. But I also figured, you know, going back to the community, the community was just a gathering or a, a, a conglomerate of various institutions. And so it was about what institution did I want to commit myself to? I didn't want to commit myself to the institution of prison. I wanted to commit myself to the institution of higher education. And the institution of higher education was like holy ground to me again. So when I was on campus, it was holy, it was safe. And I began developing like serious relationships with professors. And, you know, that helped me to start molding my ideals of myself, molding ideals of my future. And then, like I said, I ended up with this undergrad in health science, the concentration of substance abuse counseling. And I started serving men at the very same place where I was mandated to go for treatment when I was on parole. But after a while, I figured, you know, I want to go back into education. So I went back to school and I earned a master's degree in um, mental health counseling. But by this time I was burnt out with substance abuse counseling, so I didn't go on to get a mental health counseling um, license. I was just tired of counseling because it was just heavy, psychologically and emotionally heavy. But I love teaching because something else I didn't share with you was that when I was in the penitentiary, one of the jobs that I had was that of a tutor and that of a teacher's aide. So I was teaching men uh, adult basic education ABCs, one, two, threes, um, preparing for their GEDs. And then while I was doing this, I realized I'm a teacher. I'm pretty good at this, you know? And so I figured I wanted to do this. And then that old school from the teacher KRS-One, that old um, song from the uh, teacher KRS-One, um, the lyrics, um, I forget what song it was, but he says, uh, teachers teach and do the world good. Kings just rule, but most I never understood. And so, that just kept playing over my head. Teach us, teach and do the world good. This is how I could do the world good. You know, so I wanted to teach. I wanted to be an example for brothers and sisters coming out of prison to show them that, look, you don't have to keep going back to prison. You can find something else to do. And for me, that something else to do was engaging in higher education, you know, and through higher education, I, I began developing new and different relationships that would serve to uplift me and help me to see even further than I thought I could see, you know, developing newer and brighter ideals for myself. And so I did that for quite some time, you know. Um, I finished my master's degree in 2010. Um, I taught at a couple of junior colleges. Um, I did some reentry case management, some other type of reentry work, worked with juveniles who were incarcerated, who were at risk of going to prison. But still, I felt stagnant. Um, I felt out of place. Um, I wanted to be um, on campus full time. And at the same time, again, I was thinking about how can I continue to make my light shine brighter for other people who've been incarcerated, other people who are coming out of prison who feel hopeless. I said, well, hell, I'm gonna go ahead and get my doctorate, you know? But that came because I was making, I was making close relationships with professors who were PhDs and EDDs, you know? And I'm having like eye to eye conversations with them. You know, when I was share with them, yeah, I just did eight years back and so on and so forth. And they're like, whoa, really, for real? I'm like, yeah. You know, so in, in my head, in my heart, in my mind, I saw myself as their equals, you know? 
And so I said, let me go ahead and get this 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 doctorate degree. You mean you 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 belonged in the room? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And a lot of times, you know, us getting out of prison and you trying to make the transition, and sometimes they try to make force you to play to a weakness as far as job and stuff like that. And instead of I always tell people, play towards your strengths, find right. something that's going to be towards your strength, right? You know, and then and and and, that, and feel like you belong there, know that you belong there. And that's the key part of, of making the transition and getting into what you really want to do once you get out of prison and you return back into society. And I always, like I said, I tell people, don't play to your weakness. You know, right. you might have, you got to have a job. I understand that. But what I did personally was I played the job that was towards my strength. Right. You know, walking in, promoting, sales. You know, I could be able to communicate with people. Right. To communicate, through that communication, I would meet people of all different backgrounds right. and things like that. And then, you know, you have good conversations. So that's why I say you, you, you was playing towards your strengths. You mm -hmm. knew that you wanted to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. So you get out of prison, you know, you already taking these courses inside of prison. So you get out, you, you continue that. You already know, like you said, you was a, you was the uh, tutor, teacher's aide. So you already knew what you really wanted to do and what your strength was. So mm -hmm. you went through that. Right. Um, and if I could say real quick before you go on, because I, I, you sparked something for me real quick. And that is, you know, when we play towards our strengths, that is... It, indication of us being truly educated because now we know ourselves now we understand our strengths our proclivities our interests our abilities our capabilities and you know just to draw a real quick picture you know think about a circus animal or, or a zoo animal you know that's in captivity it's used to being handled or trained by the zookeepers or the circus trainers right and so it knows how to jump through a hole or, you know, ride a bike or whatever they do in the zoo and the circus. But it does not know how to act in its natural habitat. And so if you let this animal loose in its natural habitat, it would probably perish because wow. it is not well educated. Exactly. It's well trained and it knows how to function in the zoo or the circus. But Ooh. you let it out. In the wilderness, it's gonna die because it don't know how to tap into its natural proclivities. Been trained, I like that. Yeah, been trained. And then you think about it, that's what happens when a lot of people get out of prison. They are trained to work in a certain field, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mechanical field, or you know, some dirty work, and and it's not their strength. And right. what happens is they get they get tired of doing that because it's really not them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then and there's some people that do that work, and that is their strength, and they're damn good at it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's so um, man, that, that's 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 crazy. So, how many degrees do you have? Look, how many people? How did how many degrees did you have? Well, I earned an associate's degree uh, while I was incarcerated um, from Canisius College and Associates in Liberal Arts. Um, I have a bachelor's and a master's from um, SUNY Brockport. SUNY stands for State University in New York. So I have a bachelor's and a master's from there. And then I have a doctorate in education um, from St. John Fisher College in Rochester, New York. So I have a total of four degrees. Oh, wow. So, man, for those of you tuned in, man, you think that you can't get out and, and make some four degrees. And, you know, four degrees. He, he went and got that. He went and got four degrees. Well, let me tell you this, too, Brother Cardell. I met the most brilliant people I've ever met. I've been out of prison since 1997. And still to this day, I've just been about what, 23, 24 years almost. Still to this day, the most brilliant people I've ever met have been the men that I lived with in prison. This, those are some of the most brilliant men I've met from academics to, to philosophy, to mechanics, to, to um blue blue collar skills i mean the, some of the most brilliant and innovative people i've met were behind those walls but the thing is is that i think they did not have the opportunities you know right. and that's and that's and, and, I, and i agree with that most definitely because i met a lot of, big, of brilliant people behind the prison walls and like you said they just didn't have the opportunity they they was raised in the condition with the with the mindset and they and the lack of resources 
and opportunities to become greater. Absolutely. Not knowing really how to tap in and go outside of that, they end up in situations that led, led us to prison. Absolutely. Then, really tap into who you are and in prison, and some people just don't get the opportunity to make it back out. That's true. But you know, one of my favorite artists, he says, um, Bob Marley, Bob Marley says, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds, you know? So we are responsible. We are responsible for realizing what has held us down for this long. And we are responsible for finding the way out. And what are ways that you could tap in for those that's tuning in and they still trying to figure out who they are and you know what I'm saying? They might have just came home. They're trying to find themselves. What are ways that you can tap in to, you know, figuring out, to pinpoint who you really are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, you know, and what you do that? Yeah, that's a great question, Brother Cardell. You know, and I think it might vary for different people, but one of the things I think is most important for everyone is to learn to listen to one's self, you know? I think the old timers used to say it was their first mind. You know, I got to go with my first mind, you know, listen to ourselves. And so in this day and age, there's so many distractions that take us outside of ourselves. If we could find time to separate from those distractions, you know, for 15 minutes a day, an hour a day, just to listen to my own thinking and to concentrate on my breathing, just clearing my mind, you know, maybe that means taking a walk every day, you know, without looking at your phone or waking up in the morning and just meditating and stretching without the TV and the radio on and just listening to oneself, you know, but I think a couple other things that can also help is exposure, exposure to things that are outside of our norm, you know, exposure to things that we're not used to, places that we're not used to, people that we typically don't spend our time with, you know, making ourselves vulnerable, you know, to other people, being able to let people know what my fears are, what my inhibitions are, you know, what I'm not certain about, you know, and, and learning to trust ourselves, learning to trust each other, you know, and then not for nothing, reading, man, reading, read. Um, one of my main examples I'm going to tell you, man, who really um, encouraged and inspired me, and though he's not here in the flesh, but he, I think he's always here, was El Haji Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm wow. X. You know, I read his book, man, um, the, the autobiography by um, um, Alex Haley. And I think that that really caused a change in my life. You know, because one of the things that um, Alex said about Malcolm is that he never was out without something to read. He always read. And I think reading, in a sense, it's like psychological calisthenics. You know, it makes our brain um, our mind more receptive to new and different ideals. And it helps us to connect um, things that seem not to be connected to build something greater for ourselves, you know? So those would be some of my suggestions. I'm out of the Reno Hood novels now. <laughs> We're not talking about Reno Hood novels now. We're talking about, you know, really digging down into some books that's going to help you grow. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? But I mean... If you're going to read some hood novels, I mean, if that's all you're reading, that's a good place to start, you know, but you got to get off of that because that's, that's like having a diet full of sugar and starch, you know. It, it's gonna be reading. What was one of the best books that you read while in prison? Mm -hmm. Well, aside from the autobiography of Malcolm X, um, I think another one of the books that really pushed me forward was this book called African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality by Sheikh Antadia. And then another one that really, I think, helped was um, The Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson. Yeah, I really yeah. and I think uh, Sheikh Antadia's book really gave me an understanding that um, mm -hmm. Black people were responsible for a lot of what civilization is today. You know, because prior to reading that book, while I was in prison, I had no idea that Black people were the mothers and fathers of civilization. I thought our history began when they captured us and enslaved us. I believed all the myths that they told us about, you know, we were wild and we were uncivilized and we needed white people to save us. 
And so slavery was a good thing for us. That's what I, I was conditioned to believe. But once I started reading this book, you know, um, African Origin of Civilization, Myth of Reality, I started realizing that we were the progenitors. We were the mothers and fathers of the human family of all civilization and other things built off of us. And when I started reading that, I started to realize, well, hell, if these people did this, then that same greatness is within me, that same potential is within me. You know, and then I started reading, you know, stuff like they came before the Mayflower, you know, uh, they came before Columbus um, and the things of that. I, I, can't, I can't remember which one of the titles it is, but uh, I think before the Mayflower, before the Mayflower and um, they came before Columbus, something like that. But I, I was reading these books and realizing that these people, they survived the Middle Passage. Many people died, but I'm a descendant of some of those people that survived the Middle Passage. So not only am I smart, but I'm also strong, you know, so because I come from them. And so that's all of us that's here. We're smart and we're strong, but we have to be able to recognize that. And so I think through reading and exposing ourselves and talking to different people and not being afraid to fail, you know, that'll help us to do better. That'll help us to start realizing our own potentials. So when you when you got out of prison and you was making the transition to coming back into society, a returning a returning individual, mm -hmm. what were some of the challenges that you that you faced early on that you had the you know, obstacles and challenges that you had to overcome? Oh yeah, man. Um, I think one of the main challenges and obstacles, and I think anybody listening um, probably could um, identify with this, and this is the stigma. You know, the stigma that society places on us, you know, oh, you've been incarcerated. So let me close these doors in your face. You know, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to invalidate you. I'm not going to, you know, give you a second chance, you know, because you've been incarcerated. So that was difficult to get over. That was one of the biggest challenges, um, I think. And then also some internal challenges, you know, like not really being able to to initially trust people. You know, very suspicious of people. So I was still kind of rigid um, from that penitentiary style, the penitentiary lifestyle. So I had to really shake some of those chains so that I could start developing relationships with people, you know. And how it was important, because you were talking about some of the internal challenges, you know. Mm -hmm. um, really, to me, that's bigger than the, the external challenges, because I always say, you know what I'm saying, you can come out and you get all the resources, you can you do. They they got the offer, but mm -hmm. if you if you're not internally ready, yeah, then it doesn't mean nothing. Absolutely, like you have to you know you coming out. You still got them old beliefs. Your your what what things that you value really ain't in line. You still value money and and everything else, and, and then you ain't really have no expectations for yourself. Then no matter what resources that you get, they'll give you about a month or two, and you're gonna you gonna you gonna jack them resources off. Absolutely, man. That's a great way to put that. You yeah. Know? I think yeah. I was fortunate, though. I had I had a good family support, you know, some family, extended family, my mom, my brothers, my sisters, some cousins, you know. So I had a good support system. I think that helped, too. But most important, like you said, and like I said, you know, it started with myself. If I didn't if I didn't get myself in shape, then um, I would have jacked those resources off. Right. True indeed. And a lot of people get out. They don't have that family support system so what would be the best way to go about finding a support system or a mentor or something that they can, they can come and talk to who's been through what they're going through uh -huh. and again you know I, I spoke earlier about you know being vulnerable allowing oneself to be vulnerable i think that's one of those internal things that people have to work on is allowing oneself to to be vulnerable to share their story to share their pains to share their hopes and their outcomes, but then to find a family of sorts, not necessarily a nuclear family like a mom and a dad, a brother and sister, if you don't have that, that that's that's healthy, you know, but to find maybe a church family or a recovery family or a treatment system, or there's, there's places out there like that that are willing to help people or places like, or uh, setups like what you're doing, you know, these these recovery circles, these reentry circles, the reentry re support groups. You know, because I think in these places, when we go and we allow some of our vulnerabilities to show, that's when people start to reach out to us and see us as human beings and say, hey, I'm going to help this person, you know, and especially when there's other brothers and sisters 
who've been to prison or there's people who have family members that have been to prison and they hear your story, man, they're going to reach out to you. But one of the things I think also um, aside um, from being allowing oneself to become vulnerable is also um, developing patience, man. Patience. Right. You know, because a lot of times when we come out of penitentiary, we want what we want and we want it now because we ain't had it in so long. Right. We yeah. want it and we're going to get it at any cost. True indeed. But I think about this though, just in, just real quick to just sum that up. Um, and you know, sometimes I use these metaphors and analogies as you might've noticed, but I think about um, a tree, a fruit tree, an apple tree, a, a, a lemon tree, an orange tree, any tree, you know, and when it's blooming, sometimes people will pluck the fruit off of it before it's ripe, before it's ready to pick. And they try to eat it or they try to sell it you know, and they get sick from eating it or it don't taste right and it's bitter, they throw it away, they try to sell it, nobody wants to buy it because it's not ready. Right. You have to wait for the tree to reach its full fruition. And so us, like the tree, we have to continue to put in the work, build the relationships, build the skills, get the credentials that we need and have hope and belief that in the future, it's going to be better, you know? And notice I said hope and belief. But sometimes people have belief and they wish, but they don't put in any work. So if they don't put in any work, there's no hope. You know, exactly. hope, hope is this action word. When we put in work, we're working towards something better. So patience, hope, and belief. Right. Patience, hope, and belief. Patience, hope, and belief. If anyone that's tuning in right now, if you have any questions, all you got to do is just... Type it in the chat. Ask your question in the chat. We'll bring it up on the screen. Um, I think no doubt. holla. Huh? I just said no doubt. Holla. It is holla. All you got to do is just is type it in. Um, we have uh, uh, Sandy Free said, that is pivotal. Cognitive behavioral therapy. We can, we can let go of those beliefs that were taught and become our own authentic selves. And I think in order to be successful in this transition, you have to. You have to let go of that. You have to to become your authentic self because you can't be out here, you know, you can't be out here faking it because you'll fake your way right back into the penitentiary. Absolutely. You'll fake, you'll fake your way into a, a, a situation that, you know, that's going to destroy you. And before you know it, you get sent back and you may not ever come back out of prison. So you you have to really tap into to who you really are. Not that mask that you've been wearing all these years, you know, while you was out in the streets and you was in the penitentiary, and you got you got to get rid of that mask. You have to to be you, you know. You have to be feel be comfortable, feel comfortable of being you, because if you don't have that comfortability, then you will end up holding up holding up that facade, and it's gonna lead you back to prison. So you have to those beliefs. I got that's why I always tell. People challenge your beliefs. You have to challenge your beliefs because your beliefs, some of the things that you was taught, them they, they're not true. Like you said, you you had a picture that black men were just supposed to be this. Then you started reading these books and realized that if we come from a long, a long line of kings, queens, we come from greatness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not, we're we're not primitive. This ain't who what what we've been taught and what we this ain't who we are. Mm -hmm. and this is what they did. Right. This is what I, I know what I can do. Mm -hmm. But you, know, you have to know. You have to know something different. Because yeah. if you don't know, if, if you don't take in new and different information, you'll always believe that what you believe is the truth. And so yeah. you'll never come to the point where you start to, to challenge your beliefs. Because right. whatever it is you believe, that's the truth for you. Exactly. And that's what I tell people like, um, I, like I used to use the thing, I mean, I'm a product of my environment, man. This is all I know. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was for me. But you know, it's this thing that says you have belief, faith, and fruition. Mm -hmm. It's perhaps what you think is the truth. Faith is what you know to be the truth. And fruition is you walking that truth, being that mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was a belief for me that I was a part of my environment until I started looking around and, and seeing people that actually grew up in the same environment that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. On drugs, father parents was on drugs. Some of them didn't even have was missing a parent. Parent was and got killed or died. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? 
and they didn't resort. They didn't uh, resort to crime. They didn't resort to selling drugs or none of that. They they got them an education. They worked hard. They had a vision, and they made their way up out that that environment, yep. and they lived a nice, comfortable life. And they never used the, the excuse or or the belief that they was a product of the environment. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, I, I call it the half theory. They had the hustle. They had the right attitude. They had the vision, and they educated themselves, and they did some of their lives would never have to go to prison or not. And that's so right. that's why you have to challenge their belief because those of you who feel that you are a product of your environment, you're gonna have to challenge that. You mm -hmm. have to look at that. Are you really a product of your environment? Or are you using that as a as a crutch? And it's really not a crutch. You really using it as a shackle because it's holding you down. Absolutely, I like that. It's a shackle. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and that's what I always say with the challenging your beliefs, you know, just just your own beliefs, and and then the labels and marks that others don't put up on you. Are you really that? Who are you for real? Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, it's important for you to tap into yourself. Know thyself. Every day you get up, it's like you like, like you walking into that pyramid. Know thyself. You need that's to right. be that's right. you know, because when I was locked up, I stood, I read books of uh, knowledge yourself, mm -hmm. science yourself. They had like three different verse, three different chapters of that. So yeah, I read yeah. books uh Dr. Naim Akbar. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Dr. Naim Akbar is good for that. Yeah. And I think it's it's important because you have to know, you have to know your foes. You have mm -hmm. to know, you know, you have to know why you are unstable. You got to know why you are in constant. You have to know why you got a weakness. Yeah. You yeah. Know your weakness. You got to know what's causing your misery, what your passions is. Are you chasing your passions geared towards the wrong thing? And mm -hmm. that's why you're miserable. Mm -hmm. you, have to start, you have to do a self check. You know, one of the things I want to speak to, too, also, when it comes to that that self-check and that self-knowledge is that I think, uh, well, one, what was coming to my mind was this passage um, somewhere from the Bible, you know, and it says, my people suffer because they lack knowledge, you know, and so we're talking about self, lacking knowledge of self. But one of the things that, that, that we didn't touch on, really, I, I talked about this a little bit in my own experience, is the history of trauma, you know. Many of us have a history of trauma dating back to early in our lives, you know, and that trauma oftentimes it does a lot to 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 um, stymie or to, to slow down the development of our psychological and emotional selves, our decision making. And so no matter how much we learn, how much we know, if we don't address the trauma that has impacted our lives, we're going to continue to revert back to self-destructive cycles. You know, yeah, no I degrees or whatever. Right. In our group, in our uh, virtual reentry group, we do on Thursday night. Uh, probably about a month ago, we was talking about that, and uh, uh, they they call it the point of interruption. Mm -hmm. Right. So you gonna have to go back to the point of interruption. It's something mm -hmm. that happened in your life that changed the whole dynamics mm -hmm. and ended you up to where you're going. You gonna have Absolutely. to go. Back that point of interruption, like that uh the speaker, the uh speaker uh name um what's his name David Wiggins or David Higgins, uh, mm -hmm. he was talking about how his father was abusing his mother and then they abused him, and then he ended up going to the military and stuff, and he carried about his anger. Then he had he went all the way back and met up with his father and asked him questions, and from that point on, it kind of released all the things that was holding him back. He mm -hmm. went back interruption like you said right. that that trauma you like you need to go back and to revisit that trauma whatever that trauma was you have to go back to revisit you got to go back to that point of interruption and figure it out mm -hmm. you know what I'm so you can be able to let that go because as long as you hold on to that trauma mm -hmm. it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna weigh you down and you're not going to be able to take off the way yeah. you should take off and Absolutely. a lot of people up in the criminal lifestyle like with me the point of the my, my point of interruption was the find out that my mom was on crack a little heavy. Mm -hmm. Christmas started getting not getting, you know, presents wasn't, you know what I'm saying? Things started looking real bad and they played the toll on me like, now nah, I'm not going to ever have to go through this again. I got to yep. get out of my own. Forget it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. I had to go back to that point in order for me to grow. I had to revisit that, you know what I'm saying? And go back to that, that point of interruption to say, you know, and get an understanding to where I can be able to let some of that hurts and some of that trauma some of that pain and, and uh, ill feelings that I had go because mm -hmm. if I let it go, 
then I will find myself continue in and out of prison, in and out of prison. Mm -hmm. Repeating those cycles. The, the cycle. So I'm glad you brought up that trauma because it's important for you to face whatever trauma that it is that you're facing. I don't care how, how long ago it was. Mm -hmm. Went back and revisited, found some closure with it. Mm -hmm. You're going to forever, it's going to forever haunt you and hold you down. Absolutely. You got to understand uh, what it was and how it impacted you, man. Um, without that, I think, again, you know, no matter how much degrees you get or how many good jobs you get or how good you look or how much money you got, if, if your cycle emotional self is not stable, everything will fall apart. Exactly. Everything. everything. And so I think that that's why our, our real richness really lies, you know, in our cycle emotional stability and our, uh, and our um, potential to form um, and, or create and sustain um, um, uh, um, healthy relationships with other people, you know. Yeah, yeah, you got to know my uh one of my mentors. He called it the why. He says it's the why theory. It's like mm -hmm. this is what you got to figure out why. He says you got to figure out what hurt you, who hurt you, what hindered you, who hindered you, what helped you, who helped you, and then what healed you, and who healed you. Mm -hmm. Once you understand them, once you can mm -hmm. get the answer to them, mm -hmm. then you're gonna be able to move forward. And, and, and advance in your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's important too. And you know, I think another piece that that's important for us as we move forward um, in our lives and our new lives is being able to have love in our lives. You know, yeah. love for another person. It don't necessarily have to be romantic love either, but we have to have love, real love. You know be that brother to brother love, sister to brother love, sister to sister, but real love and appreciation, you know? Because oftentimes I think, again, many of us who find ourselves in prison, we probably find it difficult to pinpoint people in our lives, early in our lives, who really made us feel love, you know? But love is such a very powerful component, man, to a healthy life, you know? Some of us will love our dog, we'll love our fish, we'll love our cat, which is great, but we need other people to love as well. Exactly. Yeah, two indeed. Man, so hey, so if anybody have any questions, I'll see you tuned in right now, and I'll see y'all out there. If you got any questions, feel free to go ahead and holler back, man, type your questions in, or if you got any statements, whatever, go ahead and type it in, man. I'm enjoying this conversation with the brother. Like um, um, I'm really glad that you, you really uh, took the opportunity to come on. Uh, what's next for you? Not really sure, man. I'm just trying to keep it open, man. You know, like I said, I just moved here to North Carolina. Um, just starting a new career down here. I'll be working, doing some research at um, University of North Carolina, um, working with uh, formerly incarcerated and incarcerated populations. Um, I'm hoping maybe to start writing another book at some point. Um, maybe I'll get some, some sponsorship so I can maybe have better editing for my book. Um, than I did for my first one. Um, and just continuing to try to be an example, man, to my family. Um, I got two wonderful sons and a wife. Um, and just trying to be an example to brothers and sisters who have uh, been impacted by the criminal legal system, man. Um, but really, no, I really don't know, man. I really don't know. You know, I'm open to what the universe has for me, man. And I'm just trying to do, do right, man. So I continue to listen. I, I continue to try to make space where I can listen. You know, I try to find that quiet space, that quiet time, you know? So go ahead and tell the people the name of your book, where they can find it, where they can buy it at, where they can get it. Oh yeah, well the name of my book is um, Prison to Promise, A Chronicle of Healing and Transformation. It's available exclusively on Amazon, um, in hard copy and Kindle. Um, if you do find the time to uh, purchase my book, um, and read it. Um, I request that maybe you take some time to uh, write a review for me on Amazon afterwards. Once again, it's Prison to Promise, a chronicle of healing and transformation. You can also Google my name. You type into Google Dr. Craig Walid. You can find um, some podcasts, um, some articles. Um, I recently did a, a two part article uh, with an online magazine called Education Reimagined on part one and part two, um, those just dropped this month in December. 
Um, and there's a bunch of other things under there. I'm really amazed, man, you know, because uh, I went to prison. And so, you know, there was a newspaper article, you know, about this young boy who stabbed somebody. He went to prison, yada, yada, yada. You know, and prior to that, I had done some breaking and entries, got arrested for that. So had all this negative press about me. And so now, you know, I go, you know, into Google and type in my name and I see all this stuff about me. Uh, to me, it's pretty amazing, you know, considering where I come from. It's really humbling, man. You know, but again, I do it all not to toot my horn, but really to um, shine light on what any of us can become. If we know we have the right supports and the right belief and put in the right work, specifically those of us who've been impacted by the criminal legal system, because we are great. And oftentimes we just don't know it. Exactly. I, I, I second that. So before we go, I, I've got one more question for you. Then I want yeah. you to leave. I want, I want you to, to take us out with, with the game. Um, what made you change your name, your last name? Yeah, man, that's a great question too, man. Well, you know, I was spending time with a lot of good brothers. Um, and one of my enlighteners, he happened to be a Muslim brother, you know, and he helped me come up with the name. The name Walid means born or reborn. In certain languages, it means newborn baby. And so my mindset and my way of being and the way I saw myself had changed. And so in a sense, I was a reborn person. I was newborn in my perception and my approach to life. And so I changed my name to reflect that. So Craig Waleed, Craig is newborn, Craig is reborn. And in, in actuality, I like to think that I, I'm reborn anew each day, you know? Right. So go ahead and take us out with some game. If something, if, if, if something that you want someone to remember from this whole podcast, you can leave something. Something right now, what would it be? Mm, mm. You know, there's so many things floating around in my head. You know, one of the things I I I I'll, I'll share I shared with my kids just uh last night. I told my sons, um, I said, you know, a wise man can play the role of a fool, but a fool could never play the role of a wise man. You know, and so also another thing is, you know, we can never undo what has been done and we can never unsee what has been seen and so in reality we'll know each other or we'll know other people by the fruits that they bear mm. so indeed i appreciate you coming on tonight once again my pleasure man i thank you for having me you know reach out anytime we always have this group uh here i, I will continue to reach out i'm gonna continue to follow you just want to say thank you again for coming on and sharing your story sharing your knowledge and wisdom with the group tonight. I think we all appreciate it. Um, thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate, appreciate appreciate having you on, man. It was real good. I appreciate you having me, man. Again, I'm humbled, man, by the, the opportunity to be here to talk with you and to talk with the people that you're working with, man. So I wish everyone a happy holiday season, and I wish you um, continued success in your lives. Stay safe. Same to you, brother. All right. Peace. Peace.